probably talk about uh, some uh, history of some uh, diseases. Um, <laughs> so I just think that learning about the history and kind of the thought processes of what some diseases are considered, uh, you know, it's pretty interesting. Um, we commonly think of like food and music and other things as like part of uh, a society's culture, but actually um, infectious diseases is also a really big part of um, society and culture as well. So, and people were also, you know, had their own misconceptions about um, infections back then, just like they do now. So really nothing's changed, so. Um, yeah. Okay, so the first one I wanted to talk about is uh, malaria, um, you know, one that we uh, encounter um, not too frequently, but I definitely the rest of the world uh, encounters it uh, pretty frequently. I thought we had someone deaf here. How do I turn that off? Here we go. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but it, it does impact uh, a, a lot of the other parts of the world and, um, you know, and it has impacted the uh, United States um, in the past, uh, not too long ago. So, so just to recap, if you forgot what malaria was, it's a mosquito-borne illness that can cause fevers, respiratory distress, organ failure, anemia, and death transmitted by the female Anopheles mosquito. Um, and so, since we're talking about the history of ID, Anopheles was actually coined uh, by a Johann Wilhelm Meigen, a German entomologist uh, in 1818 from the Greek, translated as useless, um, and meaning not or without, and Anopheles meaning use help, so basically not helpful or useless. So, um, it's caused by the single <laughs> <laughs> caused by a single cell uh, parasite of plasmodium, but that's caused by the species P. falciparum, widespread across tropical and subtropical regions around the equator, largest burden in poverty stricken areas in places such as Sub Saharan Africa, Asia, and Amazon basin. 40% of the world's population actually live where malaria can be transmitted. Um, and in the 20th century, malaria said to have claimed uh, between 150 million to 300 million lives, so counting for two to five percent of all deaths. So, like I said, big deal disease. In 2020, there were an estimated 241 million cases worldwide, with an estimated 627,000 deaths. So, um, it's thought to have originated possibly 50,000 to 100,000 years ago, with a surge around 10,000 years ago due to advances in agriculture and human settlement development, most likely just promoted uh, emergence of this uh, mosquito, so that way it could be uh, transmitted more easily. Um, so malaria actually stems from the medieval Italian mala aria, which means bad air, because it was thought that the disease was transmitted by just um, air that was not good. And it was also called um, ague or marsh fever due to the association with swamps and marshlands. So there was some understanding of how it could have been potentially transmitted. Some evidence suggests that uh, it could have originated maybe in gorillas. Um, and it's been known to humans for thousands of years. And records from ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt, um, when they look back, they describe these disease patterns um, are suggestive of malaria. And actually, they were able to detect malaria antigen in uh, Egyptian remains dating back from even 3200 BC. So, um, so like I said, there's references to malaria found throughout history. It's often described with periods of fever, sweats, and headaches, and there's Indian writings, um, even in 1500-800 BC, that called malaria the king of diseases, and Greek poet Homer in 750 BC mentions uh, malaria and the Iliad, also mentions by other famous philosophers back then too. Um, Hippocrates uh, um, described periodic fevers and he termed them as tertian, quartan, subtertian, and quotidian. Um, and he actually linked the appearance of Sirius, the dog star, with 
malarial fever and misery because it appeared in the late summer and autumn when malaria illnesses rose at that time. Um, it's also noted in Chinese medical canon, uh, this Ni Chin. Uh, it links tertian and cordum fevers with spleen enlargement, blame headaches, chills, fevers on three different demons, one carrying a hammer, one carrying a pail of water, and a third carrying a stove. So I just thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it was so pervasive during the time of the Roman Empire, it was actually known as the Roman fever, and it was thought to possibly have contributed in part to its decline, and it was also considered a turning point in Euro European history in first century AD. And in 18th century, uh, Western Central Africa termed it the white man's grave due to deaths of European powers attempting to establish outposts on the continent. Mm -hmm. Um, there's no record of malaria in the Americans, uh, Americas until European explorers essentially brought the disease over with them. Um, by 1755, Vax and Falciparum were common from the tropics of Latin America to the Mississippi Valley to New England. So uh, ripe for um, the disease to uh, progress uh, in lots of different regions of the country. So, um, so this person, um, Charles Louis Alphonse Laveran, he's a French army doctor during the Franco-Prussian War who uh, was actually able to discover the organism that caused malaria. And um, he actually challenged the traditional thought that malaria was restricted to only, you know, uh, low-lying humid plains and that malaria can also occur in temperate zones and that not all tropical zones are plagued with the disease. And he knew that uh, many diseases that were ascribed to miasmas or like evil vapors or the bad air uh, were actually instead caused by an organism. And he said uh, right out uh, and you know, right up front, swamp fevers are due to a germ. So um, on October 20th, 1880, he viewed blood from a febrile soldier under a crude microscope, and he saw these crescent-shaped bodies that were nearly transparent, except for one small dot of pigment. And he uh, later examined more blood from uh, other malaria patients and saw pigment in most of them. And he deduced that uh, there were four different forms that would prove to be the life cycle stages of malaria. The female and male gametocyte shizan and trophozoite stages. And he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1907 for the discovery of it. Uh, there was another person, Surgeon Major Ronald Ross of the British Indian Medical Service, spent over a year studying uh, fruitlessly other mosquitoes that were incapable of hosting malaria. But he had a breakthrough on August 20th, 1897, that he actually called Mosquito Day. <laughs> Um, and uh, he discovered the uh, clear circular body containing a malarial pigment on the Anopheles mosquito that fed on an infected patient. And then he dissected another mosquito that was uh, uh, that fed from an infected patient and noticed there was uh, the pigment was there too. And he discovered the sporozoites and the salivary glands of mosquitoes that fed on malarious birds. So what about treatments? Actually, treatments are kind of interesting too. So quinine, um, so this is a quote by, uh, in 1671 by a William Slayman and his synopsis Medicine. Um, he said, the Peruvian bark of which the Jesuits powder is made is an excellent thing against all sorts of agues. And as we know, that's like marsh fever or malaria. Um, and uh, they called uh, this uh, quinine a Jesuits powder it was just the name back then that they called it. Um, and it comes from a bitter bark of a uh, high altitude tree uh, that's native to South America. And legend says that a Spanish countess of Sinchon was treated in Peru in the 1600s and brought the Peruvian bark to Spain. And in 1742, the tree was named Sinchoma after the countess. And if you notice that the first H was omitted accidentally and that name just stuck. So that tree is just called Sinchoma, even though they meant to call it uh, Chinchon. So <laughs> um, then there's chloroquine um, that actually arose uh, from the Germans uh, due to uh, heavy malaria casualties during World, uh, World War I. And they were uh, had low um, supplies of uh, quinine. 
tested thousands of compounds. It actually had a breakthrough in 1934 um, that discovered uh, resochen, which was the chloroquine, and then another compound called san santochen, which is 3-methyl chloroquine. And they overestimated the compound's toxicity, so they thought, oh, this, this isn't good. Later forgotten about, and then during World War II, more malaria outbroke, and then the Allied forces were cut off of quinine supplies, so lots of malaria, they need something. So French soldiers actually raided the German supply of this Santo Chen and handed it to the Americans, who then made some slight adjustments to the compound and called it chloroquine. Um, and they compared this new compound to the older one that was considered toxin, and they're like, oh, actually, this was the same thing. Um, so it was kind of interesting there. Uh, and then another um, uh, compound called Arte artemisinin, uh, which was used to reduce fever. Um, and actually this uh, Chinese, um, I guess he was considered maybe a doctor back then, Yi Hang in 340 AD. So take a handful of sweet wormwood, soak it in your sheng of water and squeeze out the juice and drink it all. Uh, and this uh, anti-malarial principle was isolated by Chinese scientists in 1972 from a plant called uh, Artemisia and actually this is very small on this screen, uh, <laughs> Artemisia annua, sweet wormwood, uh, which is known that uh, has been known to Chinese herbalists for over 2,000 years as uh, King Hao. So. Um, the earliest reports of its use date back to even 168 BC. It was originally thought of as a treatment for hemorrhoids. Um, and it was later recommended as the treatment for um, what we think he was describing as malaria. Guys, isn't that crazy, right? The doctor here, you have to try to convince your patient to take on that survey, which we've been using safely for three years. Back then, you just put a bunch of crap in a bucket with water. And yeah. like, here, take there this. <laughs> Isolated a compound. <laughs> no one had a problem. <laughs> you don't want to die. Um, so, so this is a mosquito that was actually uh, found in a, a piece of amber. And what they're pointing to is actually the um, malaria um, parasite. And here's a, a zoom in of um, the amber is actually an oasis that's urging. Um, so very old. Wait, what is that? It's called? You're this one? Yeah. That's a mosquito, and they're oh. pointing to like the malaria like parasite. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that's just a zoom. That's the mosquito smiling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is not what you think it is. Um, this is actually the artemisinin uh, plant, okay, that they use to um, make the. Uh, the drug. Uh, this was a uh, Allied Forces uh, malaria treatment facility, and uh, this was during, I think this one was World War II, where, um, you know, they were trying to prevent more malaria, <laughs> malaria from being spread, so they came up with uh, this catchy little ad to, you know, try to uh, help you from, from getting it. I'm so. waiting for you. <laughs> Um, all right. <laughs> Say it. Uh, you get what you get. <laughs> That's what the military is providing for you. That's what you get. <laughs> the next one we'll talk about is a uh, good friend, tuberculosis, um, that has been with us for uh, ages, basically. So, um, so we should pretty much know all about tuberculosis at this point. We just had a lecture on it, but it is caused by the bacterium Mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, which can affect primarily the lungs, but other places, kidney, spine, brain, so on. Spread through the air, another person inhales it, it causes fever, cough, night sweats, weight loss, hemoptysis. And according to the WHO, it's considered one of the top 10 causes of death worldwide. And it's estimated that 10 million people developed TB in 2019 with 1.4 million deaths. So maybe not as much of a big deal here, but everywhere else, uh, yes, very big deal. Um, so TB has been with us since the beginning, beginning of time, basically. Um, thought to have originated maybe 150 million years ago with a common ancestor strain of the modern TB strain, maybe 15 to 20,000 years ago, with the first evidence of TB found in India and China, uh, uh, 
3,300 to 2,300 years ago. Um, and they were able, able to find uh, Egyptian mummies dating back to 2400 BC with skeletal deformities characteristic of TB. Uh, you can actually, um, I'll show you a few pictures in a second of uh, the characteristic pox lesions. That's actually an early Egyptian art. In ancient Greece, it was known as, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this word, Isis um, is described by Hippocrates as a fatal disease in young adults and accurately defined its symptoms and characteristic particular lung lesions. And uh, another person, Isocrates, was the first known author to theorize that TB was an infectious disease. So even though there were a lot of other misconceptions about this disease, it was thought, you know, even way back then that this was probably an infection that could be spread. Um, and there was a uh, personal physician of a Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, in 174 AD, who uh, recommended fresh air, milk, and voyages as treatment for TB. And you'll see, actually, that's not actually as crazy as it sounds. Um, in the Middle Ages, they described scrofula, which is affecting the cervical lymph nodes. Uh, TB uh, during that time uh, in France and England was known as the king's evil, and it was believed that Persons could be healed after a royal touch or a complimentary visit to the royal tombs or use of a coin talisman. Um, and in 1679, um, Francis Silvius described pulmonary and extrapulmonary manifestations of the disease. So you can see that a lot of the understanding of the disease evolved over time. Uh, in 1699, first official reference to the infectious nature of the disease. So you can see that it took a very long time. Uh, for the uh, under the true uh, cause of the um, spreading and you know to be established because it was previously previously thought to be hereditary as we learned uh, not too long ago. And in 1735, uh, Health Board Republic in Italy uh, ordered isolation of consumptives, which uh, forbidden admissions to public hospitals, and said they were in their own separate locations. So that way, they would spread the disease. So this is some pictures of the. Uh, Egyptian um, art that I was telling you about. So on the top left, there's a man with a very hunched over back um, due to what is thought to be the, the POTS disease. And you could see on all the way on the right hand side, something pretty similar to that. And on the bottom left, you could see uh, the actual spinal lesion. Um, not quite sure actually what the middle one is. It's kind of funny. So uh, I don't think it has anything related to TB, but medicine back then was uh, painful so <laughs> <laughs> all right um so this is actually just some art uh, in history that um described tb you could see here um a young lady sitting on the open with uh death uh who's in uh white um you know ready to take her you could see he's holding the uh sand um clock um you know ready just waiting to take her um and actually back then um you know it was thought that like i said the open fresh air and everything uh you know having milk and things like that good nutrition was thought to help with tb and that's probably why she's sitting outside in the open like that you can see on the table next to her she it looks like she has a cup of milk some fruits you know trying to you know be healthy um so <laughs> thinking that maybe that you know, it could maybe slow the progression of the disease or heal her. Um, you know, I was also kind of wondering too, you know, why is death white? Because usually we always see him, you know, dressed in black, right? Actually, yeah. back then it was known as the uh, the white plague. Um, so because patients back then were, um, they just get pale, you know, over time. So that's probably why, you know, he's white, at least in this particular Instance. This was before COVID, by the way. This was in 2017. This was by uh, an artist, um, Russian artist. Uh, first name is Paulina. I can't pronounce the last name. Uh, this was when she was sitting in a TB clinic, and just um, she has a lot of other pictures. Um, it's called um, Breath of Air or something like that. Um, pr pretty interesting. This was by uh, another artist. Um, this was called the uh, the sick child, and uh, this is a, um, someone with tuberculosis. Uh, the artist was uh, Edward Munch, I want to say. Um, this was by uh, Claude Monet. This was a, a painting that he did of his dying wife, uh, Camille, with, who was dying of tuberculosis at that time. Uh, this was a play. Uh, don't, I can't tell you the name off the top of my head, but 
this is not a real dead person, um, this, but this is a person that they were portraying that died of tuberculosis at that time. You could see some people are a little shocked. Some people might be a little happy about it. Some people look a little indifferent. Oh, so, huh? love OM. I, I don't know. Okay. But you're probably right. <laughs> I'll, I'll believe you. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a painting of uh, uh, Fantine uh, from Les Mis. Um, this is uh, one of the characters that had tuberculosis at that time, uh, and that's uh, her child. And, you know, eventually she died, not to give it away, um, but she did die. Um, possibly from Spoilers, bro. <laughs> so, uh, and that's just another drawing of the character. Which presidential first lady died of TB? Historically. Not going to come to Eleanor or Roosevelt. Yeah. I was about to say, I thought it was her. But. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so TB, uh, back in the 18th century, you know, mortality was skyrocketing, especially among young people. It was called the robber of youth and, like I said, the white plague because people would become pale. Uh, in 1720, Benjamin Martin published a new theory of consumption that conjectured the infectious origin of TB. Uh, and uh, this gentleman, Scottish pathologist Matthew Bale, named the caseus necrotus cheese like, uh, and the abscess is tubercle. So I just thought it was kind of interesting that, you know, terms that people created, you know, 300 years ago, uh, you know, we're still using, you know, a lot of those, uh, those terms. Um, so 1779, British surgeon uh, defined, uh, well, his name is Sir uh, Her. Beckel Pott, who defined Pott's disease and other extra pulmonary manifestations. Um, another physician described miliary TB in the lungs in 1810 and 1819. There's uh, uh, this uh, person identified presence of consolidation, pleurisy, pulmonary cavitation as pathognomonic signs of pulmonary and extra pulmonary TB, and described the first appearance as miliary that progressed to larger tubercules that break down on the pus and cause the uh, cavities and empyema. Um, let's see, a German physician in 1843 uh, successfully caused generalized TB in rabbits by inoculating material from a miliary tubercule into uh, liver and lung. Um, there was uh, Hermann Bremer in 1854, was a botany student suffering from TB, did a dissertation that tuberculosis is a curable disease after he reported healing by travel to the Himalayan mountains. And actually, he was pretty influential um, in what he, what he did in his publication. He founded this one town in a mountain, uh, a mountain town in a fir forest to cure patients with continuous fresh air and uh, good nutrition. Um, and uh, and I'll show you some uh, pictures of that in a second. Uh, and in 1865, um, uh, it was hypothesized that TB was more frequent among soldiers stationed for a long time in barracks compared to the fields. And you notice that crowds in urban areas also had higher prevalence of TB. So like I said, over time, you can see the evolution of the understanding of TB and, and how um, you know people went about to treat it and, and prevent it from spreading. So. So this is actually one of the pictures. So these were called sanatoriums at that time. Uh, this is actually one of the pictures inside of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was just people with tuberculosis. They were in these, you know, special places and these, you know, really nice, pretty areas with lots of fresh air. And they just, you know, focused on rest and getting better. Um, and it wasn't all that bad, right? You know, they had a lot of fun back then. Because um, a lot of people were mostly healthy, they just had tuberculosis. So, um, but I wonder how many of those spread it to other people back then, um, inadvertently. So, mm -hmm. yeah, some no, some of them are really yeah. Look, I mean, you can see they're just chilling outside. You know, like I said, just focusing uh, on getting better. So, I mean, who wouldn't want that? Um, and uh, focused on wellness, you know. Um, so not a foreign concept, maybe to some. 
Uh, <laughs> and uh, here's a, an advertisement, actually. I, I think it's an advertisement oh, for a, tuberculosis hospital and, uh, you know, California mountains. So it's probably very, very beautiful. Uh, I thought this ad was kind of um, funny when I looked it up, uh, they, where they had tried to um, push for open air schools uh, due to tuberculosis. And uh, the first sentence is kind of a play on a Bible verse, but it says, what shall profit a child if he gains the whole curriculum but loses, loses its health? Um, <laughs> so they were just saying why it's important to have open air schools uh, to, to prevent the spread of tuberculosis and make sure that these uh, kids get well. So. Um, and then there was another one, and I think it was by the same type of people uh, that was saying that the state must protect protect its children um, to, because so many children were dying of tuberculosis, um, and that the tuberculosis campaign be really focused on the child, um, and that they basically said almost all children have dormant tuberculosis germs in their bodies, and to keep these nice. dormant germs from developing. Active disease, train children in the proper, proper use of fresh air, sunshine, good food, and rest. Who wouldn't want to go for that? You know, Actually, this so. is not uh, so far in the history. When I went, I did my away rotations in Colombia, people with DT were in open air wards. Mm -hmm. It was a, ne a negative pressure room. Same in Peru when I did the work. So this is actually still yeah. around. And actually, um, you know, I, I didn't put it in there, but one of the things I was reading about the sanatorium is actually people did get better. It actually did improve mortality, to, you know, to some extent. Obviously, not everyone was cured, but it, it really did help. It wasn't such a crazy concept. Uh, so discovery of TB was by Robert Koch. Um, taught himself to read at the age of five by using newspapers, and he just was so proud of himself he had to tell his parents at the time. So very a smart, uh, very driven individual, studied under people that we might have heard of, like Henley, Virchow, and others, um, believed that infectious diseases were caused by living parasitic organisms. And uh, at the time, anthrax was discovered to be the cause. Uh, by the um, bacillus bacteria, and he wanted to prove the same for tuberculosis. So on March 24th, which is coming up uh, in 1882, uh, tuberculosis day, that's when he presented this discovery of identifying, isolating, and cultivating the bacteria. So we have tuberculosis day, and then we eventually have mosquito day. There's probably other days too, but you know, those are two big ones. Um, so the treatments have evolved. Uh, over time with many different approaches. Like I said, rest, fresh air, um, and the sanatoriums gained a lot of popularity in the United States and Europe, focusing on nutrition, wellness, and rest. In uh, 1920s, they tried to do surgical procedures to, um, you know, get rid of the diseased lung and allow healthy lung tissue to take over by doing a thor thoracoplasty. Um, and in 1943, um, uh, some in Waxman at Rutgers discovered bacterium called Streptomyces, which produced compounds effective against the bacteria, including TB and Yersinia, and named the compound Streptomycin. And there's a building at Rutgers called the, the Waxman Institute of Microbiology, um, named after him. Uh, and in 1949, isoniazid was discovered to be used against TB, even though it was first synthesized in 1912. In, in 1950s, where Fanfan was discovered, and then pyrazinamide, and then Fanbutol. Um, and of course, that's where we get all our drugs and our treatments. Leprosy. Leprosy uh, has been known in human history as far as we know. Um, it's caused, it's known as Hansen's disease, and it's caused by uh, mycobacterium leprae or lepromatosis, which comprise that uh, complex. Chronic infectious disease, leprosy is described from the Greek word leperos, which means scaly. Uh, it's an aerobic bacillus, acid fast, obligate intracellular organism, grows best at cooler temperatures of 27 to 33 degrees Celsius and infects nerves because they're in cooler places, usually the more distal ones, and closest to skin surfaces, such as eyes, nose, and muscles, and cause neuropathy, deformities, and disabilities. Bites very slowly every 12 to 21 days, an incubation period is on average three to eight years. So clinical signs can, but it can be decades until uh, clinical signs and symptoms develop. And 
Um, leprosy is known, uh, best known for actually a lot of uh, the social stigmas that are attached to it and the isolation that um, people had to endure because of it. Um, mechanism of transmission poorly understood, possibly from droplets or maybe skin contact, but it's actually not that easy to give. Um, the nine banded armadillos are well known animal reservoir because they have a lower body temperatures, possibly red squirrels, and it's mainly confined to the subtropical regions. So, this is a picture of the little guy. Um, if you go to maybe some Florida parks, you might see some walking around. Um, don't touch them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you can see here, unless you live in the Everglades, you might eventually encounter an armadillo in Florida. So, Leprosy in ancient history, one of the oldest known diseases in human history. Um, and it's been described in different osteoarchological remains in India, dated back to 2000 BC. Um, and molecular studies show the migration uh, from the first human groups from East Africa towards Asia, established itself in Europe, Mediterranean Basin 40,000 years ago. So. Um, and there's references to the disease in different texts in India, China, and Egypt. Uh, and um, Kus uh, was used in ancient Indian medicine to indicate uh, the disease as far back as 1400 BC. And they used oil from taverka seeds to drink or rub on affected areas. Commonly interpreted as a curse from the gods or punishment of sin or a hereditary disease. And in some cultures, people were ostracized and forced to live outside society. And uh, sorry for this long quote, this was a quote from a Greek historian of uh, 484 BC, referred to the Persian population about leprosy. I guess there were a lot of them maybe back at that time. It says the citizen who has leprosy or the white sickness may not come into town or consort with other Persians. They say that he is so afflicted because he has sinned in some wise against the sun. Many drive every stranger who takes such a disease out of the country and so they do to white doves for the reason after this, rivers they chiefly reverence. They will neither make water nor spit nor wash their hands therein nor suffer anyone so to do. Uh, and another uh, quote in 150 AD by a Greek physician, Eretaeus, uh, uh, he wrote a book on the causes and symptoms of chronic disease, described with great detail the accuracy of the condition um, called elephant, referring to the uh, thickness of the skin that causes from the severity of the symptoms and uh, as not fatal and possibly transmitted through the respiratory route. Um, so even back then they thought maybe it could have been transmitted uh, respiratory wise um, and causing the large nodules and such on different parts of the body, usually more distal. Um, so it became very diffuse across Europe uh, during the Middle Ages, um, 1400 AD spread rapidly during Roman conquests and crusades. Lepers were considered carriers of terrible disgrace, treated inhumanely and isolated from society. I feel like it was probably during this time that actually they were treated the worst. Um, they couldn't go back to their occupations or their families. They were forced to live in these houses called Lazar houses. Um, you know, they were homeless. They had to wear like these bells. They had to have these clappers saying, you know, I'm here, I'm here, I'm a leper, you know, don't go near me. Um, um, they had to wear special garments or in others that they're sick. Uh, they had a lot of their personal artifacts or even their homes um, destroyed. Uh, and I thought this was a little uh, sad. I guess there was something called leper masses that celebrated uh, after the diagnosis of leprosy to declare that the afflicted one was officially dead for the rest of society. Oh my God. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, why is it so good? <laughs> um, yeah, because of their deformities. I guess it was just so disfiguring at that time. So, And they were cursed. So, um, <laughs> um, so uh, leprosy eventually began to decline because of improved standard of living and because TB and syphilis were decimating the European populations. So... <laughs> So it was likely brought over to the New World by European explorers and African slaves. Um, so leprosy stigma, here's some artwork um, about leprosy stigma. Uh, you could see this guy at this, I guess, a, a gate of like a town or something uh, telling these people that they can't come in and, and see the um, 
lesions on the face here, um, you know, because they're so deformed, they're holding a clapper. I guess these clothes maybe represent someone that had leprosy and he's telling them that he can't go in. And this guy, you can see he's got deformities in his foot, some lesions, can't really walk too well because he has leprosy. So um, and didn't want to bring these cursed individuals into their town. Um, and uh, some of them were treated even a little bit worse than that. Some of them were, you know, burned at the stake um, in large groups uh, to essentially rid them of the disease. Um, and you can see these leopard towns basically where they were isolated all into uh, one location. So, you know, they were just like happy, normal people, just like anybody else. Um, and we even had a leprosy colony here in the United States, uh, in Hawaii. Um, you can actually visit the park with a permit um, and uh, on one of the islands. And uh, I, from what I, I tried to look it up to see if there were any more uh, people still living in this colony. I think there's still a few people left. And eventually, I guess they're going to try to turn into a, like maybe a national park or something once the last person passes away. Um, yeah, but there's a, a lot of people... Um, you know, a lot of lepers didn't want to move from there because this, this was all they knew. It was kind of like, you know, yeah, that's why. And I mean, it's beautiful, right? So, so this is just what some of the lesions look like, right? So this is what's called like an indeterminate lesion. It's kind of like just that maybe little pale, you know, hypopigmented, can't really feel it too much, um, can turn into, um, a, uh, you know, a, uh, a lesion uh, that's a little bit more raised. Uh, it's called tuberculoid. Tuberculoid is actually not from tuberculosis, and it's just a description of the lesion. A um, little raised with more of a well-defined margin that uh, can get worse, um, and then become more raised and um, uh, more prominent, more hypopigmented. Um, that's called borderline, and then becomes like these lepromatous lesions. Uh, that it can be a little bit more disfiguring until it can, you know, create uh, something possibly like this. Um, because it affects the nerves, you can see here on the neck, um, swelling of the great auricular nerve um, as just another um, manifestation of the disease. So who discovered it? Um, doctor, <laughs> doctor, doctor. Uh, <laughs> Gerard uh, <laughs> Hansen, um, he was a Norwegian physician, uh, and at the time, like I said, leprosy was considered hereditary and chiasmic, and he claimed that its transmission was via droplets or close frequent contact, included after epidemi epidemiologic studies that it was a disease with a specific cause uh, and not just from, you know, these other crazy ideas people had. And, he discovered the organism, but he didn't really identify it as, as a bacteria. Um, it was actually uh, another person, um, this Albert Ludwig Sigismund Iser, um, who was able to um, identify, see the bacteria on stain. And it's now ID'd with the fight Paraco stain, because I'm pretty sure that would be a board question. Um, announced his findings in 1880. And uh, as you can imagine, there was conflict between Nicer and Hansen because uh, Hansen couldn't unequivocally identify the link between the organism and the disease. And just for, you know, a little trivia for you guys, you name the other organisms you discovered. Which was Hansen? Uh, Nicer. Nicer. You mean like Syria? Nyceria. Yeah. Nyceria. Gonorrhea. Gonorrhea. Good job. Named in his honor. <laughs> Why? How <laughs> delightful. I'm sure he's ecstatic about that. <laughs> so the history of leprosy treatment. So the first effective drug was called Promen in 1937. First used in leprosy in 1941. Metabolized to Daphne. Um, a significant breakthrough was with the development of Dapson itself in the 1940s. Treatment in the last years or maybe the rest of the patient's life, which could make compliance difficult. Um, then, you know, we got resistance pretty soon afterwards. And then we developed other drugs in the 1960s, rifampicin and uh, clopazamine, uh, to become a multi-drug therapy regimen based on experience with treating tuberculosis. And 1981, the which uh, recommended um, 
treatment for it with uh, uh, multi-drug therapy and provided it free of cost. So um, last disease, uh, smallpox. Uh, even though it's not a, really around right now, it was a huge deal uh, back in the day um, caused by the variola virus, very contagious, very serious. Variola was introduced, uh, I should say the name variola was introduced by uh, Bishop Marius of Avenches near Switzerland or in Switzerland in 570 AD from the Latin word varius, which means stained, or varus, which means marks on the skin. Um, spread through direct contact or close contact. Three in 10 people contracted smallpox die. Uh, very high cave fatalities in children and infants affected all levels of society. And in 18th century Europe, 100,000 people died annually known as the speckled mon monster in England, characterized by high fever, body aches, rash that started actually in the mouth where the um, rash would then break open and spread through your mouth and then would start on the face and then just go uh, throughout the rest of the body very fast within 24 hours. Uh, and once you get those oral symptoms, that's when you be uh, become contagious. The rash it will become pustular and start to scab and break off. And after the scabs fall off, you're no longer contagious. It could take about four weeks. And if you survived it, you would have most likely very disfiguring marks on your face or maybe even blindness. One third of the survivors actually went blind. So this is kind of how the rash would start on your skin, kind of like these little bumps. You could see the little um, uh, divots in the center. Sometimes they would drain this like, I guess, thick kind of fluid uh, that become larger, more pustular, and then eventually scab and fall off. So the origins are unknown, believed to maybe have arisen around 10,000 BC. Um, evidence of smallpox is found in ancient Egyptian mummies' faces that had skin lesions that might have resembled the disease. Uh, the most famous one being uh, Egyptian pharaoh Ramses V. Uh, who died in 1156 BC, uh, they thought bared evidence of the disease described in ancient China, even 1122 BC. Um, uh, and it's mentioned in ancient Sanskrit texts of India. Uh, also thought to have been the decline of the Roman Empire with large outbreak of the disease, uh, known as the plague on Antoine, accounted for around 7 million deaths introduced to Europe between the 5th and 7th centuries, very frequently epidemic. Um, and, uh, you know, because just the expansion of uh, people, um, crusades, conquests, things like that, ex exploration, it just spreads the disease all over the place. Um, and there was in the, uh, oh, I should, should have said, no known record of, uh, in America, North America, there was no known record of smallpox prior to European explorers, and actually the British used it as a form of biologic warfare against hostile Indians. This is just a picture of uh, the mummy uh, Ramsey the fifth, who I guess they're referring to these little uh, small white spots on his head and his face that were probably um, old remnants of the lesions that he had. So evolving treatments uh, was common knowledge uh, even in 430 BC, that those who survived became immune, and uh, herbal, rev herbal remedies and cloths were often used for treatment. Um, and this one doctor uh, in 1620s, uh, well, he was born in 1620, I should say, but he recommended uh, treating his patients by allowing no fire in the room, leaving the windows open, drawing the bed clothes no higher than the waist, and uh, 12 bottles of beer a day. <laughs> Before vaccination, it was later discovered that an inoculation, also known as variolation, could combat the disease. Um, derived from Latin inoculare, that meant to graft, and uh, refers to subcutaneous installation of the virus into non immune individuals. And there was still a very high risk of getting the disease, spreading it to someone else, or even dying from that. Um, but it what has been shown to work. Practice at least before the 18th century that we know, uh, and it gained a lot of headway in England by an English uh, aristocrat, uh, Lady Montague, after she suffered from disease. Apparently, she was considered very pretty at the time, and she was disfigured. Uh, her face was disfigured um, as a result of it, so she wanted to help others. Uh, they were actually um, 
thought that the casualty rate was much lower, maybe around 10 times. Um, and the practice reached the new world in 1721. And in America at that time, uh, Reverend Cotton Mather advocated for variolation. Um, and as you can imagine, even today, uh, there are many adversaries in his own community, medical and non-medical community, that were against this practice um, to the point where he even had a bomb thrown into his house uh, at the height of an epidemic. So like I guess crazy people always existed. Um, compared to the mortality rate, between variolated and non-variolated individuals, uh, or he compared the mortality rate between these people, and this may have, this was probably the first time that a comparative analysis was used to evaluate a medical procedure. Um, and uh, Edward Jenner uh, was is credited to have created the um, the smallpox vaccine, um, which is uh, considered the world's first vaccine. He was an English physician and scientist. Uh, he developed a strong interest in science and nature at a young age and apprenticed at age 13 with a country surgeon. At that time, he overheard a dairymate say, I shall never have smallpox for I, I have had cowpox and I shall never have an ugly pockmarked face. I guess she was proud of that fact. And it was common belief at the time that dairymaids were somehow protected from smallpox. Um, I guess through his own deductions, eventually he, he concluded that cowpox can protect you against smallpox and that it can be deliberately transmitted from one person to another for protection. And it's not that necessarily he was kind of like the first person that thought that, but he was really the first person that really um, strongly advocated, you know, this idea that, you know, that uh, you can protect people from smallpox with this practice. And in 1796, he inoculated a boy from a dairy maid who had fresh cowpox lesions. And the boy felt sick for about nine days. Uh, and then afterwards, he recovered. And then he inoculated the boy again, and he didn't develop any symptoms. Um, and he called this procedure vaccination uh, because Latin for cow is vacca and cowpox is vaccinia. Um, so the concept spread quickly throughout Europe, followed by the United States. Um, he tried to get it accepted by a different, um, by a society, can't, can't recall the name right now, and it was actually rejected. He actually had to do multiple of these um, to really uh, prove that his concept was true. First <laughs> Um uh, eventually uh, came to the United States and the United States for a brief period of time had the uh, National Vaccine Institute. Um, he made no attempt to enrich himself and spent all of his efforts devoted to the cause of vaccination. Um, he even built a one room hut in, the, in a garden that he had that he called the Temple of Vaccinia, where he vaccinated the poor. So, um, I guess, and I just thought it was interesting. Like I said, you know, he wasn't necessarily the first person that really thought of the vaccine, you know, it was kind of like ideas, you know, it seemed like it worked, but it was really the person that really pushed and advocated for this to really get it mainstream. And so I came across, across this quote that I thought was interesting where, you know, in science credit goes to the man who convinces the world, not to the man uh, to whom the idea first occurs. So, you know, just because you thought it first, I mean, that's great. But, um, you know, how, how hard are you really going to try to convince people that your idea really is a good one? So also uh, back then, up until just recently, if it was a woman who came up with the idea first, it also was a man that took credit. That's right. Watson and Crick. Huh? Watson and Crick. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I or think the. the, the <laughs> well, that's why I credited Lady, Lady Montague you know, of the uh, practice of variolation. You know, she was a big advocate of that. I think that really helped. Um, I want to say they start the Mason guy too, actually. Mm -hmm. Took some work from a, from a uh, co-female scientist and didn't give her any credit. The guy who discovers streptomycin. <gasps> All right, we, we can cite a million cases. Yeah, we can be here. <laughs> Onward. Anyway, thank you for listening. <laughs>